The High Council of Saxophonic Excellence has authorized me to share the top five practice secrets that will transform your... You can have three. Hi, and welcome to the Saxophone Academy. I'm Dr. Wally Wallace. And if you're interested in saxophone masterclasses and product reviews, please do consider subscribing. We have a lot of free goodies coming up. And if you hit the like button, I will approach the council for more secrets. I'll do it for you. Now, today we're talking about my top three practice secrets. Some of them may not be so secretive at face value, but if we dig deeper, I think you're going to find something maybe you've not thought of before that could make a big impact on your playing. Let's not waste any time. Let's dive in and talk about that first transformative secret. <music> Secret number one, habit stacking with your listening. Now, we all know listening is important. Let me ask you this. Can you name your favorite saxophone player? Can you name the favorite album? What's your favorite track? What moment of the solo do you really love? Can you sing it? Now, I have a lot of students that can't readily answer that, at least in their first lesson. But that is truly important to making any kind of progress. You're not going to get the sound you want unless it's crystal clear in your mind. You can't hit a target you can't see or here. Now, we don't need to carve out more time within our practice session. We're going to use habit stacking to add listening. And here's what I mean. James Clear writes about this in his fantastic book, Atomic Habits. It's the only self-help book I'll recommend today, I assure you. But what it says is basically, while you're doing something, stack a habit with something you're already doing. Brush your teeth, listening to Zoot Sims. Making coffee? Put on some Paul Desmond. Going for a walk? Listen to Art Pepper. Do Take an activity that you're already engaged in, add listening to it. And there are already a multitude of activities you're engaged with throughout the day, which we can add listening. So your homework, you've got homework, sorry about that. Make a list of activities where you can add listening. Now, if you're talking with your children, don't add listening there, that would be bad. But what are some of the things you can do throughout the day to add listening to the time you're already using? Driving in your car to work? Add jazz listening. A lot of us get in the habit of listening to radio or talk shows or angertainment, as I've heard it called. We feel outraged, we feel terrible. Trade that time for a little bit of Stan Getz and see how it improves your day. Secret number two, the metronome using it correctly. We're going to use it to count and subdivide rhythms before we play it. Saxophone teachers out there, you're with me. You have students that have a metronome. The metronome's ticking, but they're not with the metronome. They're kind of metronome adjacent. I used to be that way too. I couldn't count rhythms to save my life when I was a kid. I learned pieces of music by my teacher screaming at them. I would play it incorrectly, and then he would count it. I'd play it incorrectly again, then he would scream the correct rhythm. Then I'd pick it up and more or less approximate the rhythm. But locking it in, being in the pocket, requires exact rhythm, subdividing in our mind before we play it. Let's start with an example. Here's an etude I'm working on with my students this month based off You'd Be So Nice to Come Home To. We're studying Art Pepper. So before we play it and approximate the rhythms, let's dive in and make sure we can count it using the mouth part of our face first. So. Put on your metronome and use the one and two and or one and a two and a counting method. So let's count this a little bit together. One and 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 one and two and triple it for and. Count it again. Ready? One and 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 one and two and triple it for and. Got it? Now counting it verbally first, before you're playing, is going to make sure it's actually locked in with the metronome. Once we're manipulating the saxophone and actually playing the thing, our brain becomes occupied with many other things going on, and we may not be lining up with the metronome like we're thinking. 
Isolating us counting the rhythm can make a huge difference in locking in with our rhythm section, backing track, or metronome. Bonus tip, make sure you buy a metronome that is jazz enabled. If you buy just a standard classical metronome, it only beats on one and three. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. That's not gonna cut it for jazz. So when you go to the music store, make sure you get one that is jazz enabled. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Feel the difference? Much hipper, gonna help you play jazz much better. So if your metronome only beats on one and three, write the manufacturer. Let them know that in the 21st century, that's simply unacceptable. Secret number three, metacognition. Thinking about our thinking. Throughout the practice session, you may have an internal monologue. Matter of fact, psychological research has shown that some people have very active internal monologues. Some people don't. Those people are weird. I don't like them, but don't tell them. We need them. We need them for our master plan. <laughs> what was I talking about? But we can use that internal monologue by guiding it gently, like I guide my golden retriever out of the trash can five to eight times a day. So what we want to do is guide our thinking, and thinking is really evaluation. How do we guide it? With questions. So here's what I recommend. Get a little notepad and a pen, and write a question at the top of each practice session. What three things do I hope to accomplish, or what three things can I make better in this practice session? And keep that in front of you, so you're constantly reminded by what it is you're working on. And that can help avoid this. Has anything like this ever happened to you? So inevitably, I'm testing equipment, ligatures, finding the right read match, and pairing it with the mouthpiece. I'm developing some very cool products. And I'm thinking, OK, which tip opening matches which read and the ligature? And does it work best on this horn? What if I try the different neck? And then should I use a larger tip opening? But then I need a softer read. Should I use French file? Or should I change brands altogether? And am I using even the right mouthpiece for this read combination? I should try the prototype that we had earlier. And then an hour and a half goes by, and I still can't play the bridge to all the things you are, at least not the way I want it. I can't be alone in that, can I? But having that question, what three things can I make better in this practice session, will guide our thinking and our practice. So we have some objective in what we're doing and reminding our monkey brain to quit screaming about read strength and start focusing on the work at hand. And now I need your help. What things have made a huge difference in your practice? What secrets can I steal from you and adopt in my own practice, then later teach them as if I came up with them by myself and call them the Dr. Wally method. Let me know in the comments below. Well, I might give you credit. You never know. I hope you have a most fantastic weekend. Next week, we have something very exciting to share. I'll be playing the tenor saxophone. It's the one with the, the bigger neck. I've downloaded a fingering chart. I'm really excited to share what I've learned on the tenor. Am I saying that right? Tenor? Tenor saxophone. Have a wonderful weekend, and as always, go practice.